Hello, let's discuss this SDL titled gestational disorders. We start off discussing spontaneous abortion and abortion is the medical parlay for miscarriage. And of course, when you're talking to a patient, uh, miscarriage is a much more sensitive word to use in most scenarios, preferred over abortion. You don't know really how they will react to that word miscarriages again, kind of like a feather in comparison. There are two types of spontaneous abortion. They can be sporadic or recurrent. Now, 99% are sporadic. Only about 1% of couples experience recurrent abortion, which is defined as three consecutive pregnancy losses before week 20 gestation. And that 20 weeks gestation is about the halfway point or so in pregnancy. And if you ever hear early pregnancy or late pregnancy thrown around. They're kind of basing those terms around that halfway point of 20 to 24 weeks. So the question that I got when I started reading this was, well, why does an abortion occur anyways? And my understanding in a condensed form now is that there's usually some sort of chromosomal abnormality. And when that's the case, you're going to have an imbalance of proteins, and we're going to call that a stoichiometric imbalance. And we're talking about stoichiometry, think way back to when you took gym chem in college, right, or high school. Stoichiometry means that if you've got two uh, hydroxyls over here, you know, it's like, well, then you're going to make one H2O and one proton, and it's just the ratio of reactants to products. And so if you have three of a particular chromosome, but two of everything else, then that means that you're going to have an additional 50% of all of the genes expressed on that extra third chromosome, whether it's a 10 or a one or a 17 or an X, right? And so for most chromosomes, that means that there's just too many of a certain protein in the cell. And the too many of a certain protein is gonna to lead to metabolic imbalances that created an intracellular environment that's just inhospitable. And at that point, uh, growth of the multicellular organism will kind of cease uh, once that inhospitability accrues. And it'll just stop growing and stop producing the necessary feedback to the mother to continue with intrauterine conditions that are favorable to life. And so, once there's no more cell division, cell growth in the potential fetus, then uh, the uterus is just going to expulse it and go back to its normal routine of a menstruation and then a lot of estrogen and a lot of progesterone and menstruation cycle. So that's why miscarriages occur to my understanding. Again, 50% of them are due to chromosomal abnormalities which means you're gonna have normal amounts of protein except for everything on a given chromosome, whatever chromosome you have a trisomy for, you have a lot more protein coming from that chromosome. And that protein, well, not only does it function and mess up the cell metabolically, it also sucks water into you just got too much protein osmotically. Uh, something I wanna point out, the trisomies that are compatible with life 13, 18, and 21, those are our three smallest chromosomes. And so when we're saying that excess proteins are what cause a cell on the inside to fail, well then the trisomies of the chromosomes that code for the least amount of proteins are then going to be the most compatible with life. Hope that makes sense. And the other about half of miscarriages are due to Mendelian disorders, maybe something uh, big, bad, uh, autosomal recessive, uh, maybe something like a thanatophoric dysplasia, you know, or an autosomal polycystic kidney disease uh, that can take out a fetus in utero before it's even born. Lots of single gene disorders, depending on how crucial the gene is to the overall function of the cell, can cause abortions. Maternal age is the most important risk factor for miscarriage, and your risk of a spontaneous abortion kind of increases exponentially as you approach the asymptote of menopause. Another big risk factor, smoking, another big risk factor, alcohol. That should surprise absolutely nobody. Lots of free radicals generated in both conditions there. 
exposures rather. So five types of abortions, you should know them all for the exam. You'll probably get a question and the question will be what type of abortion is this? And then you'll have to pick threatened or inevitable or incomplete, etc. So the symptoms of a spontaneous abortion are vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain. The spontaneous abortion is characterized into stages. Let me rephrase that. Rather than types of abortion, really different stages within the same process of abortion. So first off, you start with a threatened abortion. And what's hallmark about this stage of the spontaneous miscarriage is that there's no cervical dilatation and there's no significant lower abdominal pain. So then we move on to what's called the inevitable abortion, and we are going to call it an inevitable abortion when the mother starts to experience crampy lower abdominal pain along with cervical dilatation. And again, the part of the cervix that's dilating is called the os, uh, just like the part of an artery <clears throat> that the part of a smaller artery that connects to a larger artery is called the ostium. Remember your coronary ostium um, for your coronary arteries branching off of the aorta. Then we move on to an incomplete abortion and the hallmark of this stage is that you're going to start to see passage of the products of conception. There will be fetal products or maybe not, uh, but material will start to get expulsed from the cervical canal. And when this has come to a halt or finished rather then we will term that a complete abortion. So there are four steps in the traditional pathway of a spontaneous abortion. Now, sometimes the mother doesn't experience any of that stuff. No vaginal bleeding, no pain, no passage of tissue, no cervical changes. And we're going to call that a missed abortion or a silent abortion where all's well that ends without any symptoms, I suppose. So HCG is something you will be tracking the moment that you know a mother is pregnant. So if that HCG starts to go really down, let me walk that back. HCG is going to go up. And then a couple months into pregnancy, HCG is going to go down like a roller coaster. And then it's going to plateau, but it's still going to be present. So you're going to have a baseline HCG of about 500 international units per liter. So if the patient experiences a drop in HCG from that 500 down to say 250, then down to 50, then you got a good feeling that there is probably a spontaneous miscarriage underway. Something is happening uh, to retard the growth of the fetus. Let's talk now about the ectopic pregnancy classical differential includes things like uh, uterine cysts and appendicitis, uh, not uterine cysts, ovarian cysts, and ovarian torsion to uh, PCOS maybe. So ectopic pregnancy, basically you get a beta HCG and you see how high it is. And if there's been some implantation event, it's going to be going upwards. Now, a lot of different places that a pregnancy can implant into, but the most common is by far the fallopian tubes. And fertilization typically occurs in the ampulla or the triangular port portion of the distal fallopian tube. And then after the egg is fertilized, it's going to get swept into the uterine cavity by Fimbriae or cilia, rather, that line the fallopian tube. So understand that dysmotility of the ciliated cells lining the fallopian tube can create an ectopic pregnancy. And this decreased ciliary motility might be attributable to an intrauterine contraceptive, so an implantable levonorgestrel implant, um, or could be attributable to smoking because we've seen this phenomenon before in the bronchi of the lungs wherein if you smoke then you slowly lose the motility of those ciliated cells that constitute your respiratory epithelium and so what happens is uh, 
eventually you get a squamous metaplasia in the bronchi even. It gets so bad, you know, that those ciliated cells turn into straight up squamous cells because of all the smoke that you're inhaling. And so we've seen this concept before. Now just take it and apply it to a different part of the body. And of course, we can't go any further without mentioning pelvic inflammatory disease. Inflammation leads to scarring because inflammation is the M1 macrophage response, but then you've got to have uh, some sort of ice pack on it, you know, and your body's natural cool down is going to be the M2 macrophage response, which is associated with the cytokine TGF beta, which tells macrophages and fibroblasts in the area, tells fibroblasts, get on it, man, and uh, start pumping out some collagen so that we can glue this tissue back together after it's been all leaky and exudative during active inflammation. So PID is going to scar up those uterine tubes and predispose you to dysmotility, ectopic pregnancy. Now, chorionic villi. So you got a primary villus that's just your cytotrophoblast, and you get your secondary villus, then all the way to your tertiary villus that's got your uh, vasculature inside of it. And these trophoblasts that form the basis of your chorionic villi, they do not care where they're at. They're just going to grow. And so if you remember how invasive and metastatic the choriocarcinoma is, that's a particular line of cancer that we've seen in the testes and in the ovaries, you remember that that is probably the most metastatic cancer that one can get in the reproductive system. Why? Well, it's because these cytotrophoblasts and syndiotrophoblasts, their MO is to invade into tissue, just grow straight into tissue. You can imagine that, you can picture that in your mind. So whenever you've got a pregnancy that's uh, implanted somewhere besides the uterine wall, it's just gonna do what it normally does, regardless of if it's inside the uterus or not. It's going to grow straight into whatever tissue is in the region. So that is a problem in the uterine tube because that growth of trophoblasts can straight up rupture the lining of this tube and create a large hemorrhage. Uh, that would be a retroperitoneal hematoma. Uh, cause a big risk for peritonitis if you've got some bacterial colonization up in here uh, and just generalized free fluid in the peritoneal cavity, ecchymosis, you would start to see at that point. Get a lot of blood up in there, kind of like the, uh, what's that called? Gray Turner sign, right? Remember when you got blank ecchymosis? Picture that, but maybe in the front, and that's kind of what a ruptured ectopic would look like. So because of the large risk of hemorrhage and downstream from hemorrhage, cardiovascular shock, this is pretty high on the differential. How do you rule it out? Get a pregnancy test or rule it in, you know. And uh, progesterone is also, could also be useful if, I don't know, you're somewhere that... <laughs> has access to progesterone tests, but not human chorionic gonadotropin. And, uh, never get stuck in one of those places, you can use progesterone as well. Imaging, you're gonna wanna get a transvaginal ultrasound. You're not gonna get an abdominal because at this point you're uncertain if there even is a pregnancy in there. Now, in most situations where you know mom's at 24 weeks, 30 weeks, she's close to term, Go ahead and get the abdominal. There's no reason to have to stick it up her vagina, you know, but if you have no clue if there's anything in that uterus, get the transvaginal. It's going to give you the better view. You're going to be closer to the scene. And finally, laparoscopic biopsy is going to be your gold standard for diagnosing an ectopic pregnancy. Now we discuss placental infections and a lot of vocabulary words in this one paragraph. This is the sort of thing I would take flip through the morning of the exam, make sure I had it down, but nothing I'm going to lose sleep over before then. So infections of the placenta, how do they get there? Same as UTIs, ascending right. So they've got a point of entry that's down in the vagina, and then they're just going to climb up like a ladder, just up the cervix, into the uterus up the umbilical cord or maybe around the wall of the uterus and then bang, they're in the placenta. So when an infection gets into the placenta, this is really bad. Why? Well, because the next stop after that is the baby, you know, the amniotic fluid and then the baby. So if you've got a placental infection 
a good umbrella term to use for that is going to be chorioamnionitis. And just plain amnionitis, that's a little bit worse. That's like one stop farther down the line. That means that the amniotic fluid itself, not just the interface, but the fluid itself has been perforated with pathogens. And so again, baby is sitting there inside amniotic fluid. Baby is drinking it for all intents and purposes, you know, and then peeing it out the other end. So if there's bacteria in that amniotic fluid, well, baby's all of a sudden got a GI tract that's got bacteria in it. And then a pulmonary tree as it develops that then has bacteria in it. So very bad repercussions for baby in this case. Fortunately, a lot of these infections are of low virulence species. One that we all really want to keep in our back pocket is going to be Listeria monocytogenes. Remember, that's a gram positive with tumbling motility. It's a cacobacillus. That means it's uh, kind of football shaped. It's not a circle. It's not an oval. It's something in between. Remember, too, Listeria is beta hemolytic in our sketch. We've got a big beta hemolytic light bulb on top of that Christmas tree. We're also seeing in that sketch a catalase cat. That's pretty important. Uh, because there's one particular immunodeficiency in which the kid gets nothing but catalase positive infections. So Listeria is on your short list for that. Now, bacterial infection of the placenta can linger around for a while without making itself known, kind of like a subacute endocarditis. So what's the number one species you're expecting with the subacute endocarditis? Strep viridans, right? It's got those dextrins that's going to make it adhere. And so that's not the worst thing in the world to get infected with, but you let it sit around for six months and all of a sudden, yeah, it's kind of bad. You need a new heart valve. And so something similar with the placenta, low virulent species, just lingers, doesn't go away. And then the a cruel of inflammatory damage is going to eat at that placenta and cause a lot of scarring and uh, maybe even preterm labor or rupture of the placental membranes. That'd be pretty bad. A uh, good paragraph here about pathogenesis. I highlighted about the whole thing. I thought the whole thing was pretty relevant and important to read. Um, I want to point out that the decidua for those of you needing some orientation like myself, the decidua is literally the tissue in between the placenta and the uterine wall. So I'll use green for it and we'll highlight it up here. It's about yay thick, you know, and there it is. It's in blue in this picture here. It's literally the tissue in between the placenta and the uterine wall. That is the decidua whenever you see it pop up again. So chorioamnitis. I want to point out that the chorionic cavity is different than the amniotic cavity, but uh, here we go. Here we go. Great photo. Open image. Oh yeah. Very high quality here, but you're seeing how You've got, so everything inside this green circle, I mean, like the Boston Celtics green, four leaf clover green, not the light green, everything inside that green circle came from that initial one egg that got fertilized. So you had two cells then three, then four cells and eight then 16 and 32 and however many cells. Well, every single cell lining that chorionic cavity came from one egg, but that's not all. You've got a couple cavities within a cavity. Because remember, you are just this little disc in the middle, right? You're a bilaminar disc at week two, and then you're a trilaminar disc at week three. So you, the little tiny laminar disc, you've got a little amniotic cavity right on top of you. 
And then you got a yolk sack right under you. Like imagine you ever seen one of those big exercise medicine balls at the gym that you can like pick up and like throw and it'll bounce off the wall, you know, and you can like hit someone on the head with it. It wouldn't hurt. Well, that's kind of how the trilaminar disc is. It's just kind of laying on top of that medicine ball of a yolk sack. And so you got a yolk sac and an amniotic cavity, and then you're surrounded by trophoblasts. And then outside of that, there's your chorionic cavity. And then around the chorionic cavity are even more trophoblasts, which are going to drill into the uterine wall and create your placenta. So that's this is the spatiality of amniotic versus chorionic cavity. So cor infections in the chorionic cavity, that's not good. Infections in the amniotic cavity, that's even worse because that's closer to baby. So a lot of vocabulary out of the way there. Uh, just a bunch of, you know, I mean, this, this section kind of reads like I'm trying to troubleshoot my dishwasher, you know, so I'm going to skip this and I'm going to say that that's, it's nice to read if you're about that type of stuff, but really all you need to know for this exam is you're going to see neutrophils everywhere because it's going to be an acute infection and you might even see neutrophils inside blood vessels. And if you do, that would be called a chorionic vasculitis because vascu vasculature and itis inflammation. So you've seen a neutrophilic vasculitis before easy diagnosis. Symptoms, same old, same old, same old. Oh, except look what we have here. Leukocytosis with neutrophils especially shifted up. So that's gonna make your diagnosis for you. It's the only pathology in this SDL that has to do with infections. Therefore, it's gonna be the only one with a peripheral leukocytosis. I mean, I don't need a color image to tell you that that is purulent. You know, here's a nice healthy placenta with clearly marginated vasculature. But again, this one, it's just wiped out. It looks like you dipped it in a bucket of paint. Uh, here are the neutrophils. Here are the neutrophils. There are no neutrophils really here on the left image. That's your normal chorioamniotic membranes. All right, now let's get into a part of this SDL I can tell you a little bit more about, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So we've got four of them. Okay, that's what you need to know. And so you need to know that because that's gonna be your answer choices, A, B, C, and D, right? And so what's, well, where are they gonna be? Eclampsia, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension of pregnancy, gestational hypertension. So if the patient is peeing out protein, They've got either preeclampsia or eclampsia. That's it. And if they have seizures, we're going to call that eclampsia. If they're not having any seizures, they've just got preeclampsia. So preeclampsia and eclampsia are the same thing minus the seizures. Now, if there's no proteinuria, we are going to classify the patient's hypertension based on whether or not they are before week 20 or after week 20 in gestation. So if mom has only had baby in the belly for 12 weeks and she's got hypertension without proteinuria, we're going to call that chronic hypertension. We're just going to say she had hypertension before pregnancy. She's still hypertensive. Now, the minute she hits week 20, she's got a high blood pressure. She doesn't have any proteinuria because you're going to get that. The day that it turns week 20, you're going to order urine albumin. And if it comes back clean, but she's still got a high blood pressure, you're officially going to call it gestational hypertension. Then. So that's a really easy way to just ask if you know the concept, you know, uh, just easy question. Again, mom comes in, she's got hypertension, no protein in the urine. It's week 24. What does she have? And you're sitting there between chronic and gestational hypertension. You pick gestational. So in this SDL, uh, hypertension in pregnancy, you ought to be looking at it and saying, whoa, something's kind of up because it's not easy to be hypertensive in pregnancy. In fact, your blood pressure normally drops in pregnancy because of all the vasodilation that's going on systemically, probably due to the large amount of circulating estrogen. Estrogen is a little bit of a vasodilator. Remember, alcoholics, 
they get cirrhosis, they, their liver stops working, and where do you metabolize estrogen? In the liver. So these alcoholics stop metabolizing estrogen, and so they get gynecomastia. But what else do they get? Telangiectasias. They get spider angiomas, you know, all over their skin. They get these little red dilated vessels and that's because estrogen is a vasodilator so you've seen this concept before now apply it to pregnancy and it's like okay mom's got low blood pressure sure thing it is normal for the blood pressure to be a little low in pregnancy i'm not talking 60 over 30 but i'm saying like like 100 over 75 100 over 70 that's no big deal you know it's like all right cool um one other thing is that Cardiac output is going to go a little bit up in pregnancy, but it's not going to go up enough to compensate for the fact that you're vasodilated everywhere. And total fluid volume, as you know, is going up too. And so you're going to throw that into your calculations if it's a truly emergent scenario. And as opposed to having five, five and a half liters of fluid on board, because mom has a baby, she's going to be closer to seven, especially as she approaches delivery. So more fluid volume, lower blood pressure. That's normal in pregnancy. And because of that increased fluid volume, how should I put this? That means that mom has a little bit of a buffer before she begins experiencing the symptoms of hypotension. So she might be hypotensive, be going into shock, but you can't tell based on the symptoms because she's got a lot of blood volume, so she can afford to lose a little bit, but her organs might be not getting enough perfusion, like her kidneys, for example, or the placenta, for example. Um, I wish I had a stronger way to say that, but that's a concept I've been exposed to. I hope you picked up a little sum on that. Hypertensive disorders, maybe one out of 10 pregnancies tops. But again, chronic and gestational hypertension are included in those, and they're pretty benign conditions. So highlighted in green, the big takeaways of these first two, chronic or pre-existing hypertension is when mom is hypertensive before the 20th week. And as soon as it hits week 20 and she's still got hypertension, we're going to call it gestational hypertension. Now, if you identify a mom with gestational hypertension, you're keeping both eyes open because that is a big risk factor for two pretty bad conditions, one being preeclampsia, the other being placental abruption. Both of those place the baby at an elevated risk. Both of those place the mom at an elevated risk for mortality and miscarriage. How are we defining hypertension in these populations? greater than 130 over 80. And please remember that it doesn't need to be both those numbers. If it's 125 over 85, that's hypertension. That's diastolic hypertension, right? And, and also if it's 135 over 75, well, that's a systolic hypertension. Can be both, doesn't have to be. A recurring concept that we see is that gestational hypertension preeclampsia, eclampsia, the high blood pressure tends to resolve simply through delivery. Delivering the baby is curative of this hypertension. So as we get more severe down this spectrum, if mom is in eclampsia and having seizures on the regular, you start to get to the point where you're like, do we need to have an early C-section? Is it viable? Can we do that right now? Just so that we can get this hypertension off the mom. So again, week 20 before and after, you got that down. Now understand that the, as soon as you see proteinuria, it goes from gestational hypertension to preeclampsia. And there's really three criteria you need to call it preeclampsia. Number one, you got to have at least 140 over 90. That's a little higher than 130 over 80. It's got to be at least week 20 of gestation. That's another preeclampsia criteria. And finally, you have to, have to, have to have some proteinuria, which is going to be associated with peripheral edema. Can you tell me why? Because of Starling's forces. That's right. You got a low oncotic pressure, lower than normal. You're peeing out your protein. So what's holding fluid inside of your capillaries? Absolutely nothing. It's going to go into your tissues. 
Risk factors include ages at the extremes, nulliparity, interesting one there, previous history of preeclampsia, pre-existing hypertension. You're not going to get a risk factor question on this. Probably not going to get a pathophys question on preeclampsia either because this is a pathogenesis that we haven't fully nailed down yet. We don't know why the things that we observe happening are happening. So again, if you get a question about this, the gist of the answer is going to be something, something, spiral arteries, something, 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 uh, systemic endothelial dysfunction, something, something, increased vasoconstriction producing hypertension. So that's all you need to know. Now I'll go through this step by step. Uh, so you have an implantation and then you have a lot of cytotrophoblasts that are gonna dig into the surrounding uterus, uh, first in the endometrium. And then as they dig into the endometrium, they're going to make connections with uterine arteries. And what do we call the arteries of the endometrium? We call them spiral arteries. Because remember, in the proliferative phase of the cycle, they're just straight. They're normal arteries. They look like toothpicks or telephone poles. But then you get a little progesterone involved. And remember, see it in your mind that progesterone says, whoa, whoa, whoa. We are going to stop growing this endometrium and we're gonna start spiraling these arteries. And so you just push all your resources into spiraling your arteries under progesterone's influence. And then you've got a lot of arteries that look like that. And so when there's an implantation event, you haven't menstruated yet, you still have the spiral arteries. So when the trophoblasts dig into the wall of the endometrium, what's the first blood vessel they encounter? It's a spiral artery, it's right there. So they dig into these spiral arteries and then the blood supply from spiral arteries is going to become baby's blood supply. You dig that? So then in preeclampsia, something goes a little wrong with that process. You don't canalize, you don't bore out, drill out these spiral arteries properly. Because, all right, so we said spiral artery becomes baby's blood supply. Spiral artery becomes baby's blood supply. You get that? So if you're not opening the spiral artery enough because there's some sort of trophoblast defect. I don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. Nobody knows. But you're not boring that spiral artery out. So reduced blood flow to baby. That's the gist of it. And here it is graphically. Normal right here on the right. And then pathology here on the left. Reduced blood flow to baby. That's what's going on. So baby gets reduced blood flow. And then this paragraph at the bottom of page nine is what happens next. Trophoblasts start making decoy VEGF receptors and a couple of other endothelium interacting factors that are going to promote maternal vasoconstriction so as to push more blood into the placenta. That makes sense. Conceptually, the specifics don't know. Yeah, like that goes over my head. But because the placenta is not getting enough blood, the way that the placenta gets more blood for itself is by vasoconstricting mom. Because if you're not getting enough blood to the baby, you don't want mom to be vasodilated. That means all the blood is staying in mom. You want mom to be squeezing blood into the placenta like out of a sponge. So that's why you vasoconstrict mom. And so then 
all of the complications of preeclampsia make so much sense now because it's like, well, okay, mom is vasoconstricting everywhere. What's going to happen? She's going to go into pre-renal azotemia. She's not going to have enough fluid to perfuse her kidneys. She's going to go into liver ischemia because the liver is also a highly vascularized organ. She's going to get some pulmonary edema because her pulmonary capillaries are squeezing like a sponge. And so all that fluid volume in her capillaries has to go somewhere when they vasoconstrict. And so it's just going to go out into the pulmonary space because that's, that's a transidate. That's hydrostatic pressure. That's Starling's forces. You've seen this before. It's easy, easy stuff. Renal failure, kidney failure, lung edema, same exact stuff going on in all three parts of the body there. What else do we have? Well, you could have disseminated intravascular coagulation as a result of all of this vasoconstriction um, eating up platelets. Uh, you're going to start clotting all over the place. You could have HELP syndrome. That's hemolysis due to the clots, low platelet count clots, and then elevated liver enzymes. Because if you're vasoconstricting the portal vein and all the hepatic artery, right, then the liver is going to go ischemic. And so there's your elevated liver enzymes. So the liver makes clotting factors. And so if the liver gets ischemic, that's going to encourage platelet aggregation. That's where the drop in your platelets is going to come from. That's going to help the DIC get started. The DIC is really going to get the ball rolling and you better, you better diagnose that quick. So how do you diagnose that? Well, you see platelets on the blood count. You can get PT, PTT in order to tell you her clotting factor status. Is she using them up? On a metabolic panel, you can see how healthy the kidneys are. And so that'll tell you about the kidney perfusion. You'll see the blood urea, nitrogen, serum creatinine on there. And then liver function tests are also on a standard metabolic panel. So that's eclampsia. Uh, there's some pathology. We're going to see this phenomenon, acute atherosis. Uh, that's a big buzzword type of thing. Expect that in an answer choice. And what you're seeing here is lipid filled foamy macrophages alongside fibrinoid necrosis, similar to early stage atherosclerosis. And so that's why it's called atherosis, just without the sclera part, without the hardening, because it's early. And then we've got uh, syncytiotrophoblastic knots at the surface of terminal villi. Um, mm -hmm. here are a couple right here. Uh, you can see these are very, very dense bodies. You shouldn't be mi mixing that up with just about anything else that you've ever seen, you know. Um, so syncytiotrophoblasts are going to be multinucleated giant cells, and then knots are essentially going to be inclusion bodies within those multinucleated giant cells. Uh, here's your foam cells. You know what foamy macrophages look like by now. Fibrinoid necrosis. It's uh, hot pink. Fibrinoid means it's like fibrin, but it's not. So what is it actually? It's type 4 collagen. That's like basement membrane stuff that endothelial cells are typically anchored to. You get some endothelial cell damage as in a, a small vessel vasculitis or hey, I don't know, a small vessel hypertension, you get some endothelial damage. Well, that means that you're going to get some basement membrane remodeling. That's where your fibrinoid necrosis comes into play. So now we talk about eclampsia, which is everything we just said, plus seizures on top of it. So the big bad azotemia, that's a possibility. Liver damage, that's a possibility. Uh, Cerebral hemorrhages, that's a possibility, especially if they've already got a weak, uh, you know, circle of Willis where you get berry aneurysms. Well, hypertension is not going to help that out. Uh, DIC still in play. And so you throw seizures on top of that. So when mom is having a seizure, you're not going to be trying to diagnose the seizure. So that's a good part. Uh, bad part is mom's having a seizure. So what do you do? Airway first. Uh, you make sure she's breathing. You get an oxygen mask on her because the brain is going to probably be a little hypoxic during this time. And then if the seizure doesn't stop, 
What I want to tell you is you can't give benzodiazepines to a late-term eclampsic mother because those are going to cross the placenta and could put the fetus into respiratory distress. And remember, benzos have a long half-life. So if mom, if you're like, all right, we need a C-section and get this baby out. Well, then if you just gave her a bunch of benzodiazepines yesterday, the baby's going to come out and he's going to have a hard enough time breathing anyways. You know, the pulmonary system is one of the very last to grow. And so respiratory depressants on top of that, you're going to have infantile respiratory distress on your hands if you do that. So the frontline treatment for eclampsic seizures are going to be magnesium sulfate. And if that doesn't work, then you can try benzos. Finally, we've got abnormalities of placental implantation. This is an easy section. Let me tell you how I look at it. Placenta previa. So it is a placenta preview. That's in first aid. Here it is. A preview of the placenta is visible through the cervix. So if you are, imagine you're a placenta, like right there, here's our cervix, right? And so it's like, I'm the doctor, I'm looking in and it's like, oh, there's my placenta. Placenta preview, you can't forget it now. So that one's easy. And then we've also got placental abruption, which once you understand what this is, this is also easy. It's just a part of the placenta rips off of the uterine wall and you're going to get some bleeding when that happens. So that's easy too. And so then we got a third one and it's called placenta accreta. And I don't got no mnemonics for this. I'm just going to remember that it's C, you know, <laughs> How do I know C? Well, it's not A and it's not B, you know, so it's got to be C. So if you're not seeing a placenta preview and you're not seeing any blood, any placental abruption, it's got to be this placenta accretive thing. So what it actually is, isn't that tough? You know, it ain't that difficult. You can remember it. Sure. Um, it's placenta accreta is when the placenta digs into the myometrium. So the decidua, remember we said trophoblasts go and find these spiral arteries, which are part of the endometrium. So if you hit the myometrium, you've gone too far. But you're the placenta. You can't reverse. What is it? You know, reverse? My car doesn't have reverse. Shoot. You're the placenta. You don't have brakes or even a rear view mirror. You just keep going dead ahead. So that's what the placenta does. It grows into the myometrium. And when it does that, we're going to call it a placenta increta. And then when it goes further than the myometrium out of the entire uterus, we're going to call that a placenta percreta. And so the quick, easy, dirty way to remember this is that that goes in alphabetical order. So just remember, you got normal and then you got accreta very first. That means it's gone through the endometrium. Then you've got increta starts with an I that's gone through the myometrium. Then you got percreta, which has penetrated the peritoneum. So inside to outside, alphabetical order, nice and easy. Something else that could help you make the diagnosis here, painless vaginal bleeding in the case of a placenta previa. Painless vaginal bleeding, doesn't hurt. Versus placental abruption, which is very, very high on your differential because it's gonna pose a threat to baby and mom typically presents with painful bleeding. So I really want to spend the time on placental abruption. Number one risk factor for this is hypertension. We just talked about all those different gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia and eclampsia. So all of those can lead to placental abruption. Something else also that can is trauma, blunt trauma, motor vehicle collision, mom gets a little shook up, a fall, bad fall, mom gets shook up, baby gets shook up, placenta gets a little bumped or a little bruised and there's a bleed. Finally, smoking, cigarette smoking, all over your body. If you're a smoker, your capillaries are going like, shoot, they're closing up, you know, and so that's basically local hypertension every time you step out for a smoke.
Now, this is the number one cause of late pregnancy bleeding. And again, when we say late pregnancy, we're talking about that 20 to 24 week range and onwards. And what's causing placental abruption again is going to be a bleed from maternal vessels inside the decidua. Remember the decidua is the tissue in between the placenta and the uterine wall. You got the decidua in between. So we got that. Patients are going to present with dropping blood pressure. Why is their blood pressure going to be dropping? Well, this is in severe cases because they're bleeding all over the place. Maybe they're bleeding out their vagina. Maybe the bleeding is totally inside. And that's the worst kind of bleed. Let's take a look at a photo of it, actually. Really good photo in first aid. Um, so here it shows you a complete and a partial abruption. So that's two different ways to look at a placental abruption. Partial means that the blood is going to be... I'm sorry, partial means that only part of the placenta has peeled off. Complete means the whole placenta has peeled off. That's pretty bad. That means you got to deliver baby right now. But that's not really how these uh, two pathologies are differentiated in my mind. How I think about it is there's two types of abrupted placenta. There's the type that you can see through symptom of hemorrhage. And then there's the type that is concealed and that you cannot see at all. And you've got to get a good ultrasound tech in there to scan for this. So if you don't catch this concealed hemorrhage, it basically becomes a hematoma. So what's a hematoma? Well, think about a subdural. It's just a big old clot, right? Because after that blood sits in stasis for a bit, blood's got clotting factors in it. It'll clot naturally. That's what blood does. So that's a problem because where does this particular blood go next? Well, one of the places it can go is right up the umbilical vein and into the fetal circulation. And that's a very bad place for a tiny little clot to go. So that's why that concealed hemorrhage is really the one that's like, wow, we have to catch this. I mean, if she's bleeding all over the place, at least you know it's happening. So that's placental abruption. It's peeling off the uterine wall. It's bleeding. You might see the blood or not. It's going to hurt. Uh, DIC is a big, big risk because when you're bleeding everywhere, we just said blood clots. Blood clots. How does it clot? Clotting factors and, give me a cell type here, platelets. There we go. Little bags of megakaryocytes. Remember those dudes sitting in bone marrow? They just pinch off parts of themselves and throw them into the bloodstream. And those are platelets. And so platelets can bind things like von Willebrand factor, tissue factor, and they can uh, aid coagulation. And so you got bleeding all over the place. You're using your platelets up. So you're going to start making all these acute clotting factors in your liver, and then you're going to start clotting elsewhere in the body too. That's going to be really bad. The shot can continue at that point. You can start under perfusing different organs. Again, we looked at that with preeclampsia. Maybe your kidneys don't get perfused. Maybe your liver doesn't get perfused. Maybe your brain's not getting perfused. Maybe the placenta and the baby is not getting perfused. So all that is a real complication of DIC when, again, you start clotting everywhere. And so it's a life-threatening condition. So when you're working this up, kind of a similar workup for a real severe eclampsia episode, uh, you're going to be getting a blood count and you're specifically going to be looking at platelets and uh, neutrophils, just to confirm this isn't an active infection. You're going to be getting a metabolic panel, and you're going to be really interested in those liver and kidney function tests. And you're also going to want to get a Kleihauer bet key test to see if there's any mixing of maternal and fetal blood. This is importantly relevant, very relevant if mom and baby are rhesus factor incompatible. Um, so speaking of compatibility, you're also going to be type and cross-matching mom. Of course, you'll have O negative on deck to give to her if she's losing too much blood, but you're going to want to get the appropriate type in there. And you're going to need a couple of ultrasounds. Uh, 
I don't know if a fast would do the job or what particular view, but you're definitely going to want to look and see the extent of that intra-abdominal bleeding. So fetal death rate of this 15%, maternal mortality 1% grossly. You can tell that there's, that's a blood clot. That's a blood clot, you know, like that's an infarction, end of story. Um, that's an infarction, that's a hemorrhage. There we go. So easy to understand, easy to catch if you know what you're looking for. And that's this whole SDL. Thanks a lot.